everyone, we thought we'd check in with you all because it's been a while and we'd really like to express our gratitude to all those people that have donated, um, patrons and PayPal donors alike, and all those people that have contributed in other ways. Yeah, that's right. Um, you know, like, we, we don't really hassle many people for money on this channel, so it, it really means a lot to us that people just voluntarily sort of seek us out and send money, whether it's from Patreon or PayPal whatever it doesn't really matter um you're all just you know like doing a wonderful thing as far as we're concerned anyway yeah um you may not realize that some of the people that send money i have said it to you know some people but i, I just want to make sure that everyone knows that's contributing to us um you are making a difference to more people than what you might imagine it's not just us we often get letters from people like um, disabled carers, people that are veterans, people that are um, you know sick. They don't necessarily you know they're having a bit of a rough time. They don't necessarily have money to contribute, um, but they love free range sailing and they write to us and they say that it's making a difference. So if you've contributed um, to free range sailing, a big part of that thanks goes to you as well. And I, I really want to pass on their appreciation. Yeah, we to really you. wanted to say thanks on their behalf. Yeah, because they, they they can't really say it to you. So if you've contributed, thanks very much. And part of that contribution that you might not be aware of um, is... Some closed captions that we've been putting on the videos, like the last 30 or so videos have had closed captions. So we've that's actually a service that we've paid for because the YouTube self-automated one is rubbish. <laughs> rough. So yeah, we, um, we decided to commit money to have really good quality um, subtitles and... I think it's a really great resource because even if English is your first language, you might not understand what we're saying some of the time. That's me. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, that's actually, there's a little box at the bottom of the screen of the video with a CC on it. If you click on that, you'll get uh, captions for all of our videos. Mm, we, we understand that not everyone around the world speaks Australian. So if you just go, what the hell did he just say? You can hit the closed caption button and you too can get help. <laughs> so, um, all right, so that covers that. You know, like closed captions, they are available if you're hearing impaired or you don't understand what's going on. So definitely use that. But we've been having a... There's been a common theme to the questions just lately. What is it, Pascal? Where can I get my free range sailing t-shirt? <laughs> or more importantly, when can I get my free range sailing t-shirt? Some people missed the boat on the first time round. It yep. was a, a limited time, wasn't it? It was only three weeks. Yeah, yeah. And the answer is now. We've just launched the t-shirt campaign. So you can get your free range sailing t-shirt. We get your really, free range on. Yeah, we were really happy with the quality, um, the design, and we had some great feedback from people that got the t-shirt last campaign. So it's going to be running again for three weeks. Um, the same design. Yep, and there's even a, a logo on the back in case you haven't seen it. Yep, there it is. And we're running with Bonfire again, so I'll put the link um, up here if you want to grab a t-shirt right now, but there'll also be a link in the description and a button at the end of the video. And you've only got three weeks. I already mentioned it. You've only got three weeks to get your t-shirt. And we've also got hoodies available. If you um, are in the Southern Hemisphere and it's a bit cooler, you it's want starting, to, starting to get a bit chilly, isn't it? Get a hoodie. Um, so they're available. Yeah. We, we did want to bring you some um, Australian Islander art, but we're having a real hard time getting it together. I mean, who would have thought? that people cruising around on a 30-foot boat might have a bit of trouble communicating with people up in the remote islands of the Torres Straits. But mm. we're still trying. Uh, we want to we want to get everything just right. Pasky in particular has got a bit of a legal mind. She doesn't want to doesn't want to make any <laughs> muck-ups. So um, it is ongoing. Well, I don't know if we'll be successful. We're still trying, so just yep. bear with us. Yep. Um, I know we said we wanted to do it. We do want to do it. It might not be possible, but... Without further ado, I guess, what's yeah. this video about there, Pesky? <laughs> we better get cracking onto the video. So last week you had us, we were at the Percy Isles and we are plotting our next trip south and a perfect weather window, <laughs> perfect weather window um, appears. So we head south towards Island Head Creek. Well, we were promised a perfect weather window, but <laughs> we were close hauled again. <laughs> Let's go and have a look. If we get another boat, we'll just have to call it Windward. 
<laughs> Still pretty ordinary, isn't it? Poor car said North Easters. South Easters is close enough, I guess. It was a 57 mile trip to Island Head Creek and we made it in 10 hours with enough daylight to navigate a fairly tricky entrance. With the wind set to dramatically increase, we needed to find a more sheltered anchorage.
So this is a pro pot. So right in here, there's a little sewn basket, so we can just chuck our bait straight in there. And then on the other side, if you undo this hook, that just shakes the pot clear. So when you've got a crab in there, you can just undo that, shake the pot, and the crab falls down through here. So let's leave that shut for the time being. And in this top bar, and this is a great idea because normally you'll have like a, a bait basket or something in a crab pot and they're just horrible <laughs> because after you've had a fish head soaking in seawater for well, overnight, they're not all that great. But with this, it's the same principle. You can just slide on up to your crab pot, undo this hook, shake it and the bait just falls straight in the water. Um, if I was a pro crabber, I wouldn't drop it in the water, would I? Because all the, all the crabs would just come and eat all the bait that I've given them for free. That was one of the unpleasant aspects of being a pro crabber that one of our friends told us about was that when you go check your pots, you rebait them with fresh pots, but you take away the old stinky bait with you. And so when we lay this pot down, then the bait hole will go down on the mud. If we left it uppermost, I'm sure crabs would still come in and they'll be like, mm, what's that? But crabs can swim, they'll land on top and they'll try and get into it and you'll, you'll haul the thing and all the crabs will just jump off. Mm -hmm. But if it's down on the bottom, they'll walk up to this thing and say, oh, it's through, and they'll try and go through and they'll walk into the pot, fall down, and then they'll be here in the bait, which is sort of what we want. Um, the tides are such that we're going to have to go in right on twilight and drop this. There's a nice gutter um, I've seen on the chart that goes up and into a nice thick stand of mangroves there. Mm -hmm. So a nice thin feeder gutter is sort of what we want. We want a feeder because we want the water to be going up the gutter and distribute its way into the mangroves and that way it's taking the smell into the inhabitants. Uh, if, we, if you've got a feeder creek here and here and it's just a normal mud bank, it might look okay, but as the water rises, you know, it'll flow around and crabs will come. But those feeder creeks, the water goes up those first and a lot of bait moves up there, crabs move back and forward in there. That's the theory. What do you think? Does it sound convincing? Perhaps? Sounds convincing, but we'll proof will be in the pudding tomorrow when we pull it. That's true. What did pro crabber say? He reckons him and his missus used to go on holiday round about now because the crabs go quiet. Due to poor fishing results ashore, I was compelled to give up some delicious coral trout wings for crab bait. Go. Don't fly hell. Yeah. Sand fly heaven. Human mm -hmm. hell. <laughs> Bye pot. Isn't he handsome? Look at that. So we've gone out, we've uh, we've pulled our pot for the morning and we've got a male crab. I know he's male because this tail flap here 
is quite a fine triangle. Um, we did another video, what's it called, Pasky, where we're catching all those crabs? My crab catch and cook. <laughs> right, hand edition. Go. I think it's, uh, it's back in the 30s, I think the episode is, where we go into a lot more detail. But this crab here, he's male, um, he's not super big, but he's still legal. But I'm confident that this crab's going to be fairly full. And what that means is that the shell will be full of meat. Sometimes people catch crabs and they call it what term, what they call is empty. So what happens is when crabs grow, they they can't just grow and split this rigid shell um, and you know be ready formed. What has to happen is they have to molt, they have to pull out of this shell, but then they're soft bodied at that time. So what they'll do is they'll inflate themselves up with water, give themselves room to grow into the future. The shell will harden and then the crab will just shrink down to its normal tissues and as it puts on weight and fat and meat and everything it fills up the shell. Um, so that's why you get an empty crab, it's not like they've gone on some famine or a diet or something like that, it's in between growth stages. I reckon this one will be fairly full and the reason I think that is because it's quite covered in get out of it, green algae. All right, He's been in this shell for long enough for it to have a fair bit of growth on there. Some of the bigger, older crabs that we found up in Arnhem Land even had barnacles and stuff like that. So as soon as I see that, I know that that crab's going to be nice and full. Other people try, you know, squeezing different bits and seeing if it's soft and so on. But a nice, dirty shell is very encouraging to me. So holding a mud crab, the safest way to do it is to be holding those back swimmerettes right in the join there. Let's just hold this crab down. So they can't reach back over their back. They can manoeuvre around and grab you on the wrist. But it's these swimmerette legs that I'm talking about with the flat paddles right there in the join. If you can get your fingers in behind there. And you can get him to release um, your anti-fatigue matting in your cockpit. <laughs> <laughs> crab so then you're okay blue manna crabs or the, you know the blue swimmer crabs you can just hold them under there and have your hand you know like that and hold them fairly well but these crabs will actually get under there and, and nip you and you can see that if they did it would be a, a big lot of trouble for you if you want to keep it alive and you know that's a good way of keeping it fresh you're better off to tie it up for your own safety all right so the way that I go about it is Here's your crab, you give him a necklace, look, look straight in front and you just get that string and you work it forward and under the elbow of the crab, forward to that nipper, like that, and the same. And then you've got a pair of reins there and you can actually tuck that crab's claws right in close under him like that and then it goes back over the back and ties in under the swimmerettes. I know you can't see it at the moment, but I'll flip him over. Oh yeah. See how it's double tucked? Yeah. So you can make that nice and tight and it will hold. And then you can tie a nice bow. I normally, he's angry. Yeah. I normally do all that last tying while it's just under my foot. Secured. That's, um, it's a handy thing to be able to do when you think you're going to catch a stack of crabs, particularly if you're going to put them in a, in a, you know, like a white bucket that we carry around all the time. Because you can just stack the crabs on top of each other and they can't fight, damage each other and, and stuff like that. The best string I've found to use, if you go into those hardware stores and get that jute, you know the stuff that's made out of old coconuts or whatever it is, that, that, that vegetable fibre string? That stuff's really great. Um, biodegradable and it, it really grips well and it's certainly strong enough to hang onto a crab. Well there's a poor old turtle out there stuck on the mud bank and we went over to try and see if we could help him or just see him but the mud is thick and sticky and we weren't going to go anywhere like we put our foot in and it went sort of to our shins and yeah we just weren't going to get there. So I think that's why he's stuck, because he hasn't left enough time to get the tide. 
So he's going to be sitting out the tide cycle there. Luckily, um, it's pretty cool today and windy and quite cloudy, so yeah. he, he should he should be all right. I or she. The, the, or she. We can't tell from here, can we? But the um, the same mud banks that made it hard fishing for me have made it even harder, harder for the poor turtle. turtle. Yeah, but it's a very turtley place. Oh. Island Head Creek. I think it's the most turtles we've ever seen. Yeah. In one place. This creek is, this little side creek is full of turtles as well. Yeah. It's mad. Yeah. What's going on, Skip? Oh, just lounging around on the bottom. <laughs> <laughs> We're in the mud. The keel's in the mud. Let's have a look at what, what our sonar has to say. Oh, yeah. The sonar is the old familiar minus point two. <laughs> Probably a bit rough on our bottom antipel, isn't it? Yeah, but at least it's soft mud. That's why I wasn't too much. concerned when it looked like that we were going to take the bottom today. Yeah. We're at the bottom of the tide now. Okay. So we're only going to be like this for an hour. Oh, like that. Yeah. It's just us and the turtle. <laughs> This is amazing, Pascal. Thank you. We didn't catch many crabs, so I guess it was time to make the most of what we did catch. What have yeah. you done here? Um, I put the crab shells, because we ate crab for breakfast this morning. Yes. <laughs> I put the shells in the pressure cooker with some fish wings, uh, some lemongrass and some garlic. We don't really have any other ginger or anything I could put in. And pressure cooked it to make a stock and then just added a few bits and pieces to the stock. Um, just There's a little bit of crab meat and a little bit of fish meat floating around in the, st in the soup and then just those Chinese um, mung bean vermicelli noodles, mung beans themselves that we've been sprouting and chilli because we're out of fresh stuff. So that's remarkable recovery, this crab's been cooked twice. Right. Well done. Which is good because a lot of the fat gets stuck in the shells and we can't eat it so. Good. As the tide started to rise, we sent the drone over to see if the turtle was still in good shape. As we got closer, we could see that she was alive and well. Unfortunately, flying our drone in strong wind uses a lot of battery, so we couldn't capture her final escape. Thank you for watching this week's episode of Free Range Sailing at Island Head Creek. If you enjoyed the episode, please don't forget to give it a like as it really helps get our video out to others. If you'd like to grab your very own free range sailing t-shirt or hoodie, you can click the link in the top right hand corner of the screen or you can head to the link in the description of the video below. Don't forget to subscribe to receive notifications for any of our upcoming videos.